December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Harry Fell, I'm the program's chairman for the Association of Old Crows Capital Club. And I'd like to say that we're celebrating a number of special occasions today. Number one, this is the first joint program held by the Air Force Association and the Association of Old Crows. And we certainly don't want it to be the last time we get together as organizations. Uh, we've just celebrated Memorial Day in the U.S. And we also have the honor of hosting seven military attaches that represent Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Southeast Asia, and North America. So this is quite an occasion. Um, we, we're also in for a very special treat today. Our speaker, Dr. Donald M. Goldstein, is a professor emeritus at the University of Pitts Pittsburgh, where he spent 35 years of distinguished service as a member of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs and as Associate Director of the Matthew B. Ridgway Center for International Security Studies until his retirement uh, three years ago. Don will present his reflections on the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which actually occurred 70 years uh, ago. And we, as most of you already know, we have copies of At Dawn We Slept uh, available. I, I'm sure many of you have already had it signed, but if anybody uh, wants copies signed, uh, Don will stick around after the talk for informal discussion and signing of books. Now, how is it that this event came together today? Uh, first of all, I want to thank Kevin Jackson, president of the uh, AFA Nations Capital Club, and Jeff Layton, who's president of the AOC Capital Club, for their full <coughs> cooperation and support of this meeting, which made today's event possible. Uh, the person who actually pulled this all together is um, Harry Dalshan, who's a treasurer of the AOC and uh, senior vice president of the AFA. I'd also like to recognize Ms. Sarah Piggott, uh, who's the programs and corporate relations assistant for AFA. She took care of all the arrangements for this. So how was it that um, we got Don Goldstein for this particular event? Uh, I met Don 18 months ago in my living room when I was watching a Maryland public television special called Prang in Pearl Harbor, A Magnificent Obsession. Uh, this special covered the career of Gordon Prang, who was a professor of history at the University of Maryland, who may be best known in the popular circles for his book, Tora, 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 which was on TV uh, just two days ago. Uh, that book was the precursor to the, this massive tome at Dawn We Slept. The importance of that book is that Gordon Prang told the story of the attack on Pearl Harbor from both sides, the Japanese side as well as the U.S. side. And it gives you a lot of insight as to how it happened and uh, how it was planned, the problems the Japanese had, in actually coming to a decision to make the attack and the issues on the U.S. side uh, as to how unprepared, we, well, we were prepared, but we were also unprepared for that attack. But what struck me most about the TV program was the remarkable man who was being interviewed, and that individual was Don Goldstein. And he's known as Goldie to his students at uh, Pitt. Where he, where he taught history for over 30 years. Now, Don was called upon while a graduate student at the University of Maryland to complete Gordon Prang's seminal work 
at Dawn and Slick. Uh, he went on to receive his PhD in history from the University of Denver, became a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, where he served a distinguished career in the graduate school, and authored and co-authored over 50 articles and 21 books. He even has his own page on Amazon.com. But what I was struck by was his professionalism, his relaxed and unpretentious style of communication, and his deep understanding of the causes of war and the devastation caused by war. It's fitting that Don makes his presentation the day after Memorial Day in 2012 during the 70th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And it's also very fitting that he make this presentation to this particular group that represents warriors from around the globe who more than anyone on this planet understand the importance of the need for a strong national military force to preserve the peace and to prevent nations from going to war. So I present you Donald Gold. Thank you very much. Here, here. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Well, now we've established I'm a fraud, okay? <laughs> the difference between me and most people get up here is I know it. Uh, I'm, I'm not an old crow. I'm what you call a frog. Down, I live in a place called the Villages. And in the, in the Villages, you have snowflakes. They come for two months. You have snowbirds. They're six months. And you have frogs. We stay till we croak. <laughs> and uh, so I'll be down there till I go. Uh, what he failed to mention, and I'll talk about it later, I was in the Air Force for 22 years, so uh, I've had a hell of a career, really, and I've been very, very lucky. And I want to talk to you today, and I've got notes here, and I'm not quite sure how to do. I feel like a mosquito in a, in a nudist colony. I know what to do, but I ain't quite sure where to begin. And uh, I say this to you without trying to be corny, because there's, there's a lot to talk about. But let me say this uh, before we go any further. Uh, Pearl Harbor represents a time when this country was really backward. Pearl Harbor represents a time when we woke up. Uh, I think uh, they try to compare Pearl Harbor with 9-11. It ain't so. 9-11, God bless it, if you had a son killed or you were there, it was bad. This morning, it took me five hours practically at the airport, three hours actually, waiting. But Pearl Harbor changed this country like it's never been before. Before Pearl Harbor, nobody went to college. Pearl Harbor gave us the GI Bill, one of the greatest things. I talk about this because sometimes we forget it. One of the greatest benefits of all time. Only the rich went to school before Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor, we all went to school. Pearl Harbor changed the role of women. Before Pearl Harbor, women stayed home, had babies. There was guys like me, couldn't stand us, but they stayed in there. Now, Pearl Harbor gave women independence. They kept the checkbook, they stayed home. It wasn't one of these wars like I was in, in Vietnam and Korea, where you went six months or a year. You were in for the what? The duration. And so people stayed away for years and months. Now, you know this, but I just want to review this just a little bit. Pearl Harbor changed uh, the role of the black man. It really, really did. It gave us the civil rights movement. Uh, it was the beginning of it. Uh, you could argue with the Tuskegee Airmen did what they did or they didn't do, but it showed that black guys were human and they could fight just like everybody else. Pearl Harbor changed medicine. Uh, during World War II, nobody said, where's your HMO card? <laughs> How much do you have? What, what is your deductible? Uh, they tested people. They gave us glass eyes. They gave us orthopedic stuff. Uh, uh, they changed the, the whole role of medicine. Pearl Harbor took, I gotta watch how I say this because it's politically incorrect, but I'll do it anyway. Took the New York Jew and the California Slicky Boy and the Hick from Alabama and put them all on units together. Most of them had never been outside of Fairfax. <laughs> and they really had, now they're together for four years, living together, seeing what a Jew looked like, what a, uh, how an a, a Islamic person looked like, or what, what a Mormon did. It unified this country, it really, really did. Before this, and I've talked to people, they had never gotten out, they didn't know this. Pearl Harbor changed the role of America. Before Pearl Harbor, we were isolationists. Unfortunately, after Pearl Harbor, we're too much internationalists, which is 
talk about later. Uh, Pearl Harbor gave us the bomb, changed weapons. Pearl Harbor gave us the awful thing called the Holocaust. So I wanted you to see uh, people sacrificed. Uh, Pearl Harbor wasn't just a New York thing. I mean, the media, uh, uh, please, 9-11 was bad. But I have to tell you, it ain't Pearl Harbor. And it didn't make the changes that Pearl Harbor did. And I wanted you to see that. And one of the problems we have now is that they don't change this anymore. And so as the years go by and people die off, and they're dying at the rate of 15 or 16 under the day, that in six or seven years, there'll be nobody left to tell the story, and then the Lord knows what the story will be like. How did the Japanese do it? How could they sail 3,000 to 4,000 miles across the ocean and not be seen? How could they develop a bomb that would sink a battleship? How could they develop a torpedo that wouldn't stick in the mud? Where were the aircraft carriers? Did Roosevelt know? What about the communications? We broke their code, didn't we? We should have known what they were doing. There are many unanswered questions. And as the years go by, they get bigger and bigger, and you get these unanswered questions. A guy that studied this was my mentor. His name was Gordon William Frank, a boy from Iowa, Pomeroy, Iowa. Uh, went to the University of Iowa on a track scholarship and played baseball, and believe it or not, was an all Big Ten third baseman. Uh, pretty good scholar, and his professor talked him in to not playing pro, pro baseball, but going to college and going on for his PhD. He was a German extant, a German uh, heritage, and so what he did was he, uh, he, he studied German, and he knew how to speak German. He went to Germany during the times of Adolf Hitler. So he was there when Hitler came to power, and he translated Hitler's speeches. He was the first guy ever to translate Hitler. There's a book called Hitler's Words. It's still out there somewhere. Frankly, it's the only book he ever published. Good scholar that he really was. Uh, in 1937, uh, he came back from Germany, got married to the boss's daughter, the head of the department at Iowa, got a job at the University of Maryland. That's Berkeley for two years. Got a job at the University of Maryland. Stayed there until 1943 when he was sent uh, overseas, ironically, to Japan. And the story goes something like this. Uh, he heard about this. He went to see his commanding officer. Sir, uh, I'm a German. I speak German. I know Hitler. I know all about Germany. Why don't you send me over there? And the guy said, uh, Reese Frank told me this, German scholars are a dime a dozen. We, <laughs> we need you in Japan. Case closed. You go. So he went to Japan. And he became a historian under Charles Willoughby. And Charles Willoughby was a German also. Big, heavy set guy, and Frank and him never got really got along. But you old crows would understand this. They spoke German, and that was good because the Japanese couldn't understand them. So they would sit there, that was the code. They go like the Navajo Indians, they'd go back and forth, et cetera. Frank stayed there till forty five and then came back to Maryland. On his way back, they offered him a job, and the job was to write the history of the Pacific War and stay in Japan and work for Douglas MacArthur as a historian. So Prang goes back, and he stays in Japan for six years. And while he's there, he begins to realize, you know, when you get beat, you tend to remember. I can remember every race I lost. The ones you win, you don't care about. But the ones you lost, that F that you got in that class, that C minus that you got, that you could have, why didn't I answer that damn question? I knew the answer, et cetera. You tend to do that. So the Japanese wanted to talk, and believe it or not. And so he talked to Fuchida, who led the attack on Pearl Harbor over 100 times. He talked to Genda, who planned the attack over 100 times. He talked to Watanabe, he was one of the chief officers there. Uh, he became a friend to all these Japanese people. Well, a lot of the people were jealous of him there and uh, because he, he kind of cornered the market on this. Uh, he promised he promised the people, he promised the Japanese, and I've got this down in the pit library, 127% of his profits. 
I'll give you 1%, I'll give you 2%, I'll give you 3%. You know, and what happened, fortunately, and unfortunately, you know, they all died, so we didn't have to pay them off. But, <laughs> but uh, he promised these guys he was going to write this definitive work on Pearl Harbor. And it was going to be the book. And uh, he got a contract with McGraw-Hill for $10,000. 1951, which was a lot of money in those days. It ain't bad today, <laughs> but, but a lot of money in those days. And he's going to write this definitive word. Comes back to Maryland. Uh, now I enter. I grew up in a place, the real Virginia, Tidewater. <laughs> I mean, I mean not, not Alexander, no reflections, but, but <laughs> the real Virginia, you know. And uh, uh, during the war, and I was 12 years old, worked in the shipyard down there in Newport News. Uh, worked on outhouses, if you're really interested, it's a true story. <laughs> they paid us in silver dollars in those days, so that I made $20 and you come over with these $20, boy, here's a lot of money. <laughs> they paid you off, uh, silver dollars, can you imagine getting 100 silver dollars or 50 silver dollars? Well, anyway, that's a small story there. Uh, the war came, like everybody else, uh, I didn't know where Japan was. In fact, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of myths of Pearl Harbor. Some people thought Japan, that, that uh, Pearl Harbor was in New Jersey somewhere, you know. Uh, I'm serious. And, uh, but I grew up during the war, and I, I watched it develop, and I lived in this <coughs> area there. And uh, my father was a, was a Jew, and my mother was a Catholic. So it kind of made me a half-breed uh, in those days. And it still is, I guess. And uh, I got a scholarship to the University of Maryland. I was going to run track and kick extra points. So I got to Maryland, and there were a bunch of animals there. Uh, Mojoleski, Petruzzo, Chemonsky, Wieszkowski, Sofreski, and they all lived in coal mines. They all came from Pittsburgh, which I'd never heard of. It's I the other day. I didn't even know anything about Pittsburgh, and now all these guys are from Pittsburgh. And we all sat in the same class together, and I took this class from this guy named Gordon Prang. And hell, I, you know, I, I could answer questions, because in Pittsburgh, I mean, in, in Virginia, uh, first boatload of women, first house of Burgesses, George Washington, Yorktown, Jamestown, Williamsburg, you better know your damn history. <laughs> I mean, you really do, you learn it. And, and so I could answer the questions. I back there, my little t-shirt, and I answered the questions. He'd call on me, and we took up uh, kind of a liking for each other. Uh, uh, he told me about the books that he was writing, and uh, I became like a gopher. I wasn't a graduate researcher, I was a gopher. And I tell you all this, because this is kind of a miraculous story here. And so one day he calls me up and says, now, you, we're going down to Baltimore Harbor, and we're going to unload this ship. So I go down to Baltimore Harbor with him, two other professors, and about three other students, actually. And this ship comes in, two tons worth of papers. I'm not making this stuff. 500 and some boxes of stuff, all from Japan. From 1945 to 1951, he had every book, every article ever published in Japan. How in the hell he did this, I don't know. You'd never do this today. But he got them to give it to him, and he got the president of the University of Maryland to take it. And they're all over here in Maryland now at the University of Maryland Library, the McKellen Library, or Hornbeck Library, and uh, uh, take up a whole, almost a half a building uh, of stuff. I don't know how he did this. Anyway, we did it. And he, he talked to me about Pearl Harbor, and he used to have me over his house, and the Japanese guys would come in, Fuchida, who became a born-again Christian. We'll talk about that later. And Genda, who planned it back, and we sat down, and I'd listen to him talk, and I'd sit there, you know, and blah, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. He couldn't drive a car at all, so I used to drive his car for him, or walk. I don't know why, but he just couldn't drive a car. Uh, well, he lived over in Hyattsville, or River, uh, Riverdale, uh, Sheridan <coughs> Avenue. Well, to make the story short, uh, uh, I was in ROTC. I hated it. God, I hated it. God, I had to put the damn uniform on it. And I, I did it because I, I was going to get drafted. You know, and so at uh, 10 minutes to 11, I'd put it on. And one, at 12, 10, it was off, man. <laughs> and once a week. And I'm serious. And back in those days, right, ROTC was big. Now, Maryland, we had 3,000 and some in the core. We filled that whole thing by, by the armory. I'm telling you, it was big. By the time we got out there, it was time to come in. I mean, it was, it was something. But I hated it, but I did this, and I had to do it. 
So uh, Frank and I are talking, and, uh, and I get my uh, degree, and I worked on my master's degree with him uh, uh, on Adolf Hitler. Hitler's first year in power, did a hundred different newspapers. Got all involved in it because I'd see what Babe Ruth did that day and what Lou Gehrig did and look at the fashions, but I finished, it took me six years to write a master's. It only took me nine months to do the PhD thing and six years to do this <laughs> master's because he was hardy, but he taught me how to write. And so I go off into the Air Force and I find out, geez, it's fun. Fly a few planes, you know, I have a little money in my pocket, I get to travel overseas, and before you know it, uh, I'm staying. And so I stayed at the Air Force 22. I got, I got married, had four kids, and couldn't get out, really. But, but uh, I stayed for 22 years. And I tell you all this because we're building up into, the, into what we find out and what we have without boring you on this. Uh, every year I'd get a card from Prang. I'm going to finish this book. I'm going to finish this book. I'm going to finish it. And then it came to mind by 1973, he ain't going to finish. Finally, it's like Virginia Woolf, you know, uh, the story there, uh, uh, Richard Burton. I'm going to write it, I'm going to write it, but he, he just couldn't put it away. Got a movie out of it called Torah, Torah, Torah. Uh, people ask me, where's the book? There never was a book. Uh, uh, but Torah, Torah, Torah be, uh, becomes a movie. In those days, we call it terrible, terrible, terrible. Uh, uh, great actors. Uh, Good, good, good history stuff. But in those days, the public wasn't ready for it. No sex. You know, no women in it. That's very, one woman driving a car around for about five minutes and another secretary. That was about it. If you saw the movie, that's about it. Great flick, though, really. Definitive work on Pearl Harbor, if you're really interested. Well, uh, I get out of the Air Force. I go to teach at, uh, I get my PhD at Denver, and I went to George Washington. I, I lived in this town here. I went to GW, I went to Georgetown, went to Maryland, <laughs> and finished up at the University of Denver. And, you know, I went there, I was a big hero. I was not poor. I was in Korea, I was in Vietnam, but, you know, I just, uh, I was there. Uh, anyway, he'd write me in by 1977, I was out, and I'm at Pitt, and I'm teaching, and he calls me up one day and says, I'm dying. I got cancer. Oh, Jesus, I don't know why he called me. <coughs> and so I go up to uh, River, Riverdale there, and there he is. He's in Pretty Bay. He wants me to go to McGraw Hill to write this, to, to see if we can't get this book published. So he sends me along with a, she was an Air Force lady too, Chief Warrant Officer, Captain Virginia Dillon. She died about three years ago. And she, was, she worked for him for 20 years for nothing. I'm telling you, nothing. I think she loved him. I'm not sure. She was a spinster. And uh, we went up to McGraw Hill, they didn't want anything to do with us, but I convinced them that, boy, it's going to be the 40th anniversary of, of Pearl Harbor. And this guy's got this book. Now, I get to his house, now we're looking at, we're looking at oh, about 17,000 pages. <laughs> no, I've got 40 foot lockers. I mean, this, this, is, this, is, uh, this, this house is really bad. I mean, this is the way his stuff is. So he says, uh, you know, uh, uh, he wants to be part of it, but they told me, I know what circumstances can be, but if you can get one volume, and I said, well, how about like the rise and fall of the third Reich or something? They said, all right, something like that. One volume, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look at it. So she and I went to work, uh, and it was pretty bad. I was in Pittsburgh. She lived over here in uh, Boston, uh, in High Rise Apartment, Hyde Park, if you know where it's at, off of Glebe Road. And uh, she and I uh, would, every weekend I'd come down on the telephone, and we had about eight months, and we, we put this thing together. Now, I have to tell you, it's a miracle. No backspace, no computer. The woman typed 120 words a minute on an Underwood typewriter. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. Uh, you know, we, we had, we, when you make a mistake, you had 10 carbons or five carbons, and you know, those who've been through, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, really tough stuff, but we were able to get it. When we decided to change the name, instead of calling it Torah, 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 we came up with that dawn we slept because we were afraid that, that uh, people would think they'd read it. I mean, it's been out there for all these years in the movie, but it wasn't a book. Well, we put it out, and we, were, we figured, ah, you know, if we sell 5,000, we're going to be lucky. Well, the New York Times, that paragon of virtue, 
because she called, <laughs> said it was the greatest thing ever done. Gave us three pages on a Sunday edition in December 1991. 81. Yeah, 81. Three pages. Greatest thing, blah, blah, blah. Well, the book took off. And uh, it's been over a million and a half copies. And uh, we reached number three on the bestseller list. Only Jane Fonda's workout book and Andy Rooney playing speak and beat us. And uh, we were on it for 47 weeks. Well, once you make good, then stuff flows. And so out of this, we got, uh, uh, we began to write other books. And we, fin we have 27 books that we've done. I just finished the last one. Uh, we did one on a fellow named Fuchida. Fuchida led the attack on Pearl Harbor. Frank was going to do his story. Fuchida becomes a born-again Christian. I'm not quite sure he understood the Trinity or what it was, but I, more of an evangelist. You know, evangelist spreads the gospel but doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I shouldn't say it that way, but you know what I mean? That, those theory to the thing. And uh, Frank's doing this book with Fuchida for Reader's Dodgers. And one day he gets a knock on the door and this lady comes in and says, this is Fuchida's daughter, and I'm Fuchida's mistress. Well, that, in those days, this, we're talking about 1970s, oh God, my, you know, we, so what happens is Frank doesn't do that story anymore because he can't. He feels like bad. We finished it for him. It's called God Samurai. It's out there now. The irony of the thing is that the, all this kind of stuff hangs together because the guy that converted Fuchida was a guy named Jacob de Shazer. And I just finished his book last year. It's called The Return of the Raider. And de Shazer was in Jimmy Doolittle's raid. I know I'm digressing here, but it's interesting. He was in Jimmy Doolittle's uh, uh, raid, got shot down, was a prisoner of war for 40 months. They beat the living daylights out of him. Uh, it's kind of like uh, Unbroken. Uh, more true, I think, than that, but that's another story. Uh, uh, the Shazer finally one day gets religion and decides, by God, uh, if I ever get out of here, I'm going to go back and teach these guys Christianity. So he gets out of there, he goes back to Japan, opens up churches, meets Fuchida, converts him. So now you got the guy that led the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, a Christian, and then you got the guy that got shot down by the Japanese, Christian, and you got them together. That was one. We did a book called Miracle of Midway, which was the story of the Battle of Midway and how that was, et cetera, using Japanese sources. Uh, probably uh, what happened was in all these 17,000 pages that we had there, we did a, uh, two other volumes on Pearl Harbor. He was going to do three volumes, and by God, we've got it out of it. The second book is called The Verdict of History, and it's the story of who's responsible at Pearl Harbor, which we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. And we're going to get questions, because that's the way you really get into this, is a lot of questions that, that you're going to answer. And uh, let me tell you this. Uh, I probably know more about this subject than anybody else, because they're all dead. And uh, <laughs> so when you start doing something, he did this for 37 years, and I've been doing it for 30. So we have about 60 some years of, of really looking at this stuff and uh, Pearl Harbor it out. But, uh, we, this book is called A Verdict of History. It goes into who's responsible, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then we, we did another one on December 7th, and we did a diary, and uh, I don't want to get into all of it. We ended up doing kind of like a factory, about one every nine months. And uh, you know, one on D-Day, one on Battle of the Bowl, one on Vietnam, one on Korean War. Uh, you know, we, uh, we started farming out. Well, Frank, of course, never saw this. I'd like to tell you that we had promised this guy that we were going to do this book for him, but uh, we didn't. But his family, of course, uh, gets the proceeds, et cetera. So the book is still out there. And now what I want to do, I'm doing pretty good here, is talk about what did we find out, et cetera. All right. If you think we're bad now, we were bad then. The Japanese really, really, really couldn't possibly have done this. They had slant eyes. The babies were carried on the back. Everything they made was crap. It wasn't like Toyota and Sony's. They'd stuff with junk. I mean, literally, we made, made Japan, forget it. It was junk. They couldn't possibly do it. Therefore, 
we let them do it. And so the myth becomes out there that Roosevelt knew and that he let him do it because he wanted to get us into World War II. <coughs> and I've looked at this thing over and over again, and I have to be honest with you, there's some questions that still aren't answered, and some people will never believe me, but Roosevelt didn't know. We find woulda, coulda, shoulda, must have. Nowhere can I find something say, dear Joe, let him come, Frank. You know, we find innuendos. We know that Roosevelt wanted to get us into the war, but the war he wanted to get us into was in Germany. What we forget is that Adolf Sugar Grouper did what? Declared war on us. Had he not declared war on us, and it doesn't take a Rhodes Scholar to figure this out, we probably would have done what? beat the Japanese first, and then gone after them. Because if you look at all the war plans, we were thinking about fighting, but the whole concept was win the war in Europe and then go to Asia. Now, a lot of this was because, even today, if you didn't know this, the leading denomination or the leading group of people, or whatever you want to call it, ethnic group in this country, is not Chicano, it's not Mexican, it's German. They are more people of German descent, even now, than any other group in America, believe it or not. And, you know, so there's, a, there's this, this thing going on, what, when, et cetera. Roosevelt was faced with a lot of do-gooders, a lot like today. We'll talk about this. We'll talk about 9-11. We'll talk about intelligence, what we found out. And I'm doing this without my notes because it's better. You know, otherwise you're there reading and you can, you know, but I've got it there if you want to see it. <laughs> now, uh, Roosevelt was caught in a country that didn't want to fight. The draft was passed, 213 to 212 with 17 abstentions, only because George Marshall pushed a few heads. This is back just before the war. Our army was ranked 19th in the world between Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. The men didn't have guns. I know, I talked to them. What they did was they had broomsticks. And they marched around broomsticks. And they, marched. they didn't have tanks, they had jeeps and they put a sign, this is a tank. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I was told, I mean, I, you know, I, I talked to these people. We, we had World War I ammunition. Uh, the whole tactics of fighting a war were entirely different. Uh, in the country, the country had gone to war in World War I for 15 months, believe it or not, that's all it was. And what did we get out of it? Jimmy Cagney singing, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. You know, George M. Cohan. Uh, uh, death destruction, so the country did not want what? War at any cost. So you had a lot of people in the American Firsters. You had the German-American Bund. You had people talking, Senator Nye is making a speech. He's making a speech in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania right across the street from where I taught when the bombs had fallen. And then he says, ah, nah, Roosevelt made this up. So you, you, get, you get Charles Lindbergh standing on a pedestal saying, we don't want to go to war. So the country, the newspapers were anti-Roosevelt, McCormick and, and uh, Sissy Patterson, uh, the Washington Post. Uh, they were all anti-Roosevelt. They were anti, because you see, in a way, Roosevelt, God, that sounds like this bad, was a new dealer. And the new dealer was communistic. And that's why when I go to Chicago and talk, even now, socialism, communism, uh, social security, entitlements, <laughs> sounds familiar, right? Uh, that kind of stuff. So the, the, the country was not united with him, okay, on this thing. In fact, he promised to keep America out of war, right? My dog, Fowler, hates war. You can do that a lot better than I can, okay? But uh, he promised to keep us out of war. And so you get this. Now, let me say this to you. To have a conspiracy, the country's too dumb. You'd have to implement George Marshall, the paragon of virtue, the Marshall Plan, You'd have to instrument Harry Stimson, who, Henry Stimson, who was Secretary of War, a Republican, who was so virtuous that when we broke the code, and you close would know that, he said what? 
Gentlemen don't read other people's mail. You'd have to implicate Henry uh, Knox, Frank Knox, who was a newspaper reporter from Chicago, a Republican. You'd have to implicate even Kimball and Short. You couldn't get away with, a, with something like this. Roosevelt's aide was a fellow named Bridgall. His son was on the Arizona. Roosevelt loved the what? The Navy. The Navy was his thing. And World War I, he'd been assistant secretary of the Navy, but right after the war, he loved the Navy. I'm not going to change people's minds, but what I'm going to tell you is what we found, what he found, is that woulda, coulda, shoulda, musta, etc., we can't. What you do is you get people writing books. Uh, a fellow named Stinnett put a book out, you know. And boy, best on it, they said, boy, we got the telegrams right here. Well, I checked them out. These messages were never sent. They were added after to the committee. So yeah, you, you have a, a, a fellow named McCullum who wrote a, a think piece about how Pearl Harbor, what would happen if it happened. Well, we found out that nobody's ever read it because it, you, you could never give something to the President of the United States without somebody having a check on it. You guys in the military here, you know damn well some colonel, some major, somebody would have to see that. You don't, you don't have a, 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 a thing that's separate, but we saw that. All right. So I want to get off of this, but I wanted to make sure that you understand that's where I'm coming from. Now, let me tell you this. Five, ooh, I guess it's five years from now, Great Britain is going to release some papers. Uh, Britain waits 75 years. In that, there may be something between Churchill and Roosevelt. But as of now, no, 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 no. We found that there were a lot of indicators, and these indicators in, in a flow were like this. Uh, 11 months before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Peruvian ambassador in a cocktail party picks up from a cook the idea that he'd heard the Japanese talking about attacking Pearl Harbor. He tells Ambassador Gru, who tells uh, the, the, the Cornell Hall, and they say no credence. So there was that. Uh, a fellow named Martin, who was the head of the Air Force, the Army Air Corps at that time, wrote a report telling the new admiral, who just came to power then, a kibble, that the Japanese would attack us on a Sunday morning, how it would be done, etc. A fellow, two fellows named Martin and Bellinger, all within three months, did another report saying this is the way it's going to be done. We, we, we noticed that, uh, that they had uh, other indicators, which I'll get to in a minute, but I want to make some myths of this thing. Uh, as the story is written, you have intelligence and you talked about the Japanese having these farmers in the field and they were pointing with arrows how to get to Pearl Harbor. Well let me tell you, finding Pearl Harbor is like finding the Emperor the Washington Monument. How the hell are you gonna miss it? I mean there was no way they could miss that. There there was no organized intelligence as such. What happened was on a Monday morning the ships went out. On a Thursday morning they did what? They came back. You can sit on top of the hill and watch them. Arizona. You read the newspaper, Arizona beats the California, the two battleships, in baseball, so you know they're in port. You pick up a phone book, and in the phone book, there's the list of the units and who's there and who's not there. And so you didn't have to be a road scholar to figure out what we were doing. You could just sit on top of the hill, and that's what this guy named Yoshikawa did. We interviewed him about five times. Just sat on the top of the hill, Watched him come in, drove around in a taxi cab, nobody stopped him, write it down, then he could report. So they didn't have to have this great intelligence net. Now, to you close here. We had broken the Japanese code. We knew what they were going to do from a diplomatic point of view. We had not broken the JN-25 code, which was the Japanese military code. Now look, I'm not a code breaker, but I have to tell you people, the greatest thing in that war, what won the war, was not the, it was the code breakers. 
okay? The code play, we were able by 1942 to tell you when they were going to the bathroom, who was going and where. And that's just like a quarterback there. Hit one and he's faking, you know. You, you don't go for the fake, you hit him. You know what the play's going to be. And you know the count. And so we were able to do this and we, we broke the code and this was probably one. But in the early days, we had not broken the code. Okay. But there were indicators out there. The Japanese changed their disciples. We picked up a message in, uh, in November of, of uh, November saying that if uh, negotiations break down, we're going to, uh, things are automatically going to happen. So we knew that something was going to happen. We knew this. But uh, now what happened was this, and I talked to people out there, they would go on alert at Pearl Harbor. Well, after a while you get tired of going on alert. I know that when I was teaching, they'd have these fire drills. And after a while I wouldn't leave. I just shut the door to stay. Man, this ain't no fire. And, and, and so if you keep playing this thing over and over again, you don't think it can happen, uh, et cetera, but, but it does. All right. Now, we were in pretty bad shape. The, the intelligence officer, listen to this one, the intelligence officer named Fiedler, he worked for General Short, the commander of the army, did not have a security clearance. <laughs> he did not have a security clearance, yet he's out there. Okay, Fiedler. We can look him up in the book as we go along here. Uh, they had changed the codes. We had ideas. We knew that something was up. The question was what, where, and when. And we thought, uh, through studying this, that it was going to be the Philippine Islands. We intercepted a message November 27th which said the Japanese are moving towards the, uh, the Kwa Malay Peninsula. Uh, this is a war warning message. Be prepared. Now, if you watch Tora 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 the other night, they were kept debating, what does he mean? What does he mean? One of the things about the military, which is good or bad, and this is where I'm giving the blame, in the military, the man in charge is responsible. If you're the commander, you're a general, and got one in there now, and something happens across the street and you're eating lunch, it's your fault. It's your fault. And so what happened at Pearl Harbor was these guys were not ready. Now, there were other guys out there. There's a fellow that I want to bring your attention to, a fellow named Block, B-L-O-C-H. Block was the commander of the 14th Naval District. It was his job to defend the, the base there. He gets away got clean out of this thing. They, they, they concentrate, they being the people on Kimmel and Short. In fact, Kimmel's son, grandson now, or maybe great grandson, they almost passed the bill uh, about eight years ago. It went through the Senate, true story, to exonerate Kimmel and Short and give them back their rank and give them a medal. And, and it passed. Well, thank goodness it didn't make it. What happened was, <laughs> no, what happened was it was an amendment to the finance bill, the budget bill, and the budget didn't pass. And so they got, so you've got people constantly trying to rewrite history, which we're going to talk a little bit about here in a minute, what we learned. We learned there weren't dogs on the beach barking in code. We'd heard that. Now, I'm not making this up. They were supposed to be a dogs on the beach barking in code. They're German, there's a German spy out there writing a, 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 a lantern, et cetera. Uh, there's a dentist. Yeah, you get the, we tried to track down all these. And what we could find is, like 9-11, they called us asleep. Now, what happens here is that there are nine investigations, nine investigations reaching from, from failure to act to uh, ne negligence, all convicted, yet nine investigations to tell us what we knew, somebody screwed up. Like 9-11, you have an investigation to tell us what we know, somebody screwed up. So we really didn't learn. After Pearl Harbor, we created a thing called the Central Intelligence Agency. The idea of the CIA was to take care of all intelligence and coordinate it. Well, we know it didn't do it. Because what happens after 9-11? We create another damn agency above that. And so we don't seem to learn. What I've learned here, which is really, and you'll like this one, I got interviewed about a month ago from a guy talking about Pearl Harbor, and he asked me who the president was. 
<laughs> who was president at the time. And so the minds go, the minds, in other words, people, what we've learned here is that people don't study it anymore. History is soft core, engineering is the way, the money's in the game. We don't teach history anymore. Uh, in the villages where, I, where I'm at, I'm in this classroom, I pick up this book, one page on World War II. Okay? Uh, when you go to Japan, and this one that we've, this is stuff that we've learned. Uh, in Japan, they don't study World War II. If you go to Hiroshima, any of you, you'll see a book there, and it starts with Hiroshima. Nobody says anything about Pearl Harbor. Nobody says anything about World War II. Uh, and the Japanese are in deep trouble, uh, and we'll get to this a little, maybe a little bit later. They were worse than the Germans in some aspects. You don't want to be a prisoner in a Japanese prison camp. You get the hell kicked out of you. They had a unit called 731. 731 took people's arms and put them on legs, put legs and put them on arms, uh, uh, filled a, shot them full of cholera to see how they react, cut women's bodies open to see how the baby would be if they did this. Uh, they were a terrible, terrible outfit, which we incidentally captured all the stuff, didn't hang them because we wanted the information. We wouldn't do the dirty job, but we wanted the information about what had happened there, and so we kept it. Ironically, one of the big villains that we learned, and it's not original, is it's all about oil. 90%, 90% of all oil that Japan got came from the United States. Half their tin that they made the war weapons came from them. What happens is, is that the Japanese want to have an empire. See, we created Japan. In 1853, John Wayne sailed in the bay there, the <laughs> barbarian and the geisha girl uh, with Perry. Uh, Japan was backward. We had the Meiji Restoration. Uh, they go to Prussia and get the army. They go to uh, uh, Britain and get their navy. Uh, in 1895, they shocked the world when they beat the Chinese. 1905, they did one better. They beat the Russians, they dragged the white guys through the streets. Tsushima Straits, Pearl Harbor, all over again. Yamamoto and the boys were there. Now they're becoming great, and the American monster wants to keep them from becoming great. We, we cre Frankenstein created it, and now we're really worried. And these guys are breaking out. Uh, we had stolen the Philippine Islands in 1898, which was a mistake, and now that's our Achilles heel. And so now we're really worried about the Pacific, and we're a Pacific power, and we want to keep the Japanese down. And so, really, sincerely, because, uh, and the Japanese said the Brits have an empire, the Belgians have an empire, the, uh, the Americans have an empire, why can't we? And so we said, uh, Jimmy Carter kick, I call it, get out of where? Get out of China and we'll give you the oil. Well, they didn't. So what did they do? They greatly underestimated us. What they did was, they thought that they could attack us at Pearl Harbor, knock out our fleet, move south, keep our fleet out for six months, get the riches of the Dutch East Indies, and then sue for peace. And they read the newspapers and saying, by God, we won't fight. We'll give up. They told me that they really underestimated us because they read our newspapers. They studied here. Yamamoto studied here. Uh, Genda studied here uh, at Harvard. And so they understood the way we thought. They greatly underestimated us. Instead of dividing us, it cost united us like nothing's ever done before. So they really didn't understand us, but we really didn't understand them. And today, we don't really understand them. See, 30 years later, because we thought they were little guys, we didn't look at them, and so instead of dropping bombs, they dropped Toyotas. Instead of shooting bullets, they shot yams. And because we didn't understand them, we did the same damn thing again. These guys couldn't possibly do it. Now what we've learned here, and this is really a, a tip, I'm rambling a little bit, but I think I'm making some points. What we saw here was something that, that, that's really bad. We tend to interpret history by today's standards. In 1941, excuse my language, a Jap was a Jap. Dirty little Jap. If I say that today, I'm wrong. But in the context of then, 
Yes. When you make a movie about World War II, damn it, you smoke. Cigarettes won the damn war. I mean, you can't say, well, it's politically correct. When you put a statue, when you go to the World War II monument, and you listen to this gentleman, and he'll do it sometime for you, I'm sure, and he's talking about Roosevelt's speech. Yesterday, a day of infamy. And he ends that speech with, so help us God. It ain't on there. Somebody pulled it off. You cannot interpret history by today's standards. Dropping the bomb today would be bad. Dropping the bomb then was the right thing. And I can prove it, and we maybe get some questions on this. I want to leave some time that we can do this. Then it was right. Today it ain't. Don't try to rewrite history by today's standards. You've got to figure out what they were doing then and what they were thinking. And if you talk to them, they saw us in a tiny different light. You see, in America in those days, today it's a lot different, man. I'm telling you, down the villages where I'm at, boys, I mean, now, I mean, it's really, military is good again. But in those days, it wasn't exactly so. In those days, it's my son, the doctor. It's my daughter, the lawyer. You send your son to work for Westinghouse. Your daughter works for U.S. Steel or whatever, Alcoa or Facebook or whatever. Okay, they do that. In Japan, the best and brightest were in the Navy. To be in the Navy was the finest thing you could do, to die for the emperor. What I'm trying to tell you, if you want to understand Al-Qaeda and you want to understand the world, you have to understand who they are, where they're coming from, and we learned that here. We did not understand them, okay? We didn't understand that the samurai code is much like Al-Qaeda. You're going to die for who? For the emperor. Emperor is God. Who said so? The religion said so. The samurai, the Ushido code. You're raised that way. Okay, it's not 17 maidens, but, but it's the same principle. And so you have to understand that. We did not understand that. And even today we don't. What we don't realize, and this is the same thing, is that <laughs> Japan, and they're in trouble, but they basically built their economy up to number three in the world, or they were two for a while, etc. And they were able to do this because Uncle Sucker is protecting them. So instead of building Toyotas, instead of building good cars, we're building the best tanks in the world. We're building the best military equipment, God bless us, in the world, and they, they, they don't have to worry about it. They got a free ride. They're building cars. And we never realized that. I mean, I'm still not sure we realize it. And the point is that they got a free ride. And, 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 and so we have to, to see this. Uh, World War II, after the war's over, we had the Marshall Plan. One of the greatest things we've ever done. Free room, board, books, and tuition. No interest. God, what a deal. Man, I would tell the Frenchman, you bastards, don't you understand that? Don't you understand this? Don't you understand what we did? Now, we did it for our own sake, but nevertheless, we did it. And so, we've got to understand it. Now, what's this got to do with Pearl Harbor? It's got everything to do with it because it's all mixed in that jumble of what we learn and what we saw and what we've done. So, the book, boy, look at I have a bunch of notes here. Uh, the book that you're looking at there is 37 Years of One Man Heart. Uh, I footnoted it. I wrote the introduction. I wrote the conclusion. I put revisionist revisions in there. But it was his work. He went out and did this. And it's, it's a story of what a man's magnificent obsession, as we've talked about, what one could do if they tried. But the story there is that you've got to be prepared for the unexpected, because it what? Usually happens. Pearl Harbor is a story there of not thinking that something can happen, and it does. The Pearl Harbor survivors, uh, most of them are dead now. There are 2,500 left. That's all. You used to be about almost 100,000, and they're not going to meet anymore. But their motto is, be prepared. And so whether you come from Thailand or whether you come from 
you're not an Arab Republic or whatever the hell you're from, you got to be what? Prepared for the unexpected. And you got to know thy enemy, because if you don't know thy enemy, Sun Tzu is right. Know thy enemy, know thyself, 100 battles you will win. If you don't know one or the other, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. And so that's really the secret and the odyssey to this. And so now I've done pretty good here, and I'd like, because of time, to give me this so this is better here. Uh, I could have done more. I'd like to open this up to some questions now. Anything is good. Uh, don't, just because I said it, don't make it right. Hell, I could be wrong. I mean, uh, <laughs> but I'll answer anything that you want to about this or anything else if you want to, the next 10 minutes that we have. Please. I don't have work because I closed it with something else. I closed it with something else. Nice. Don't worry about that. I'll give you a chance to clap in a minute when I sing my song. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you and I discussed earlier uh, the fact that Herville Yardley had his uh, flak chamber up in New York City at the uh, terminus of the uh, cables, the Atlantic cables coming across, where he was able to uh, collect uh, a lot of the intelligence and his cryptographers out there doing his work. Of course, Henry Stimson shut that down. We uh, had almost zero intel at the time. You see, that this. And it was a mess. Sun Tzu says this again. Pay your spies well. Your spies are important people. You saw this happen with getting Al-Qaeda. Right. You want to mess around with the taxi cab drivers, the prostitutes, the bums, as you call them. You want to get your information. You pay your spies well. To American spying is... It's not fair. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're, we're honest people. It's just our culture. It's not fair. You, know, you don't do that. And so Yardley had this thing figured out, but others didn't. And the only is good if your information is taken by who? By the people that are in charge. After something happens, somebody says, well, Ryan, who knows? Yeah, I knew about all that. I tried to tell the old man, you know, how many times have you heard this crap? I mean, and it may be true, I don't know. But my point to you is that you're right there, and, and, and spying is important. And this shows you uh, what can happen if you're not spying, and particularly what you can do if you are, and what old clothes did. In the final analysis, what old clothes did. Uh, intelligence, damn it. Electronic intelligence, important. Probably the most important thing going. Somebody else, please. Yes, sir. Sir, thank you very much for your comments. Well, I, I have two things. When I lived in Korea and went to school, my favorite professor was a refugee from Shanghai, the Chinese, who came to Korea via New York City and taught me much of what was in this book. But he had, had been, because he understood that, and he said, you Americans don't learn this. So what you said is very true, but you said something that struck me as I'm not sure I heard it correctly, but you said one of the things that happened because of Pearl Harbor was the Holocaust. No, I, it gave us the Holocaust. I'm not sorry. Sure what you meant by that? What I meant by it is that, is that it, where, it got us into World War II, and out of World War II, we got the Holocaust, and we got the bomb, and we got medicine. It didn't give us the Holocaust, but the concept is there, and, and you get it. So I stand corrected. What are, in your view, what are the major mistakes that we make as a country when we're asleep? Because well, in your book, one of the fascinating things is the commanders didn't think that the Japanese would actually right. strike the fleet. They That's thought right. they'd hit the installations, and therefore they didn't think the Japanese would be able to develop a torpedo. Okay. What, what, what you hit is something that's important. What is the real weapon. What is the real thing? The Japanese made a terrible mistake. And they tried they knocked out a bunch of battleships that weren't worth a damn. They should have knocked out the dry docks. And if they knocked out the oil in the dry docks, they would have sent us back for months. So you've got to know what your target is and, and, and what you're going. So in that aspect uh, that, that comes out in this thing is that what is the target? What is our objective? What are we trying to do? Now Without getting into this too much, uh, uh, without getting too much current events, it seems to me that after World War I, the world was made safe for democracy. Everybody was democratic. Within, within uh, 19 years, you had Franco and Hitler and Mussolini <laughs> and, and uh, Mosley and, and Horthy and Bratenau, and, and I could go on, on and on, Hitler, of course, on and on. Why? Because the country could not understand democracy. 
So what I'm saying to you, and this is another story here, not in this. If you got to know that, you got. How can you expect a guy in Iraq to understand democracy as we know it, when they never had it? It takes a while. Or Afghanistan, or United Arab Republic, or whatever country, or Thailand. I mean, how do? You, it's a different culture. It's a different society, and this brings that out. You've got to understand that they are not us. And while you make it available, it's not us. We, we didn't get this. You say, what's this got to do with, it's got everything to do because we underestimate, we don't understand, we don't study, we don't do. Now, you hear people saying, we got to do it, but nobody ever really does it because we're more interested in, in uh, uh, idol, and dancing with the stars, and, and uh, <laughs> no, no, it's good, you know, there you are. And, uh, you know, who were the nationals now playing good ball for change? You know, and so you, you really, you're interested in that, and so you don't. But the answer is, it just, that's really one of the problems that you've got here, understanding that. Okay, somebody else, please, on Pearl Harbor. Yes, yes sir, now I'll get you. Okay, well, that's, that's, See, that's one of the, it's coming out now, the do-gooders have brought it out, and rightly so. We took honest Japanese citizens who had fought in World War I, and we put them not in concentration camps, but in internment camps. Now, we couldn't do it in Hawaii, because 40% of everybody in Hawaii was, was Japanese, but we did it on the West Coast. This is one of the black things that we've done. One of the problems that you have is, in time of war, it's tough to be democratic. You got to blame somebody, but it's also tough to be. If, if, if you're, that's right. But if you're a German, look at you. I'm making that up, but you, but you know what I'm trying to say. If you are, then then I'm what? Mm, really, that's right. And so if you're if you're Muslim. I mean, it's tough. I'm trying to answer you there. We tend to do that. That was one of the black marks in American history, what we did to these guys. I mean, but, you know, no worse than, than see, out of World War II, can you imagine you're a black guy and you're over there getting shot at somewhere and you come home and you come to Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, and you walk in and there's a black man's bathroom and a white man's bathroom, and a white woman's bathroom, and a black man a woman's bathroom. You can't eat lunch. Yet you went to fight for what? <laughs> you see the pattern repeating itself, though. You see what happened. We, we, we underestimated everybody in the streets except for us. We were impervious. We didn't pay attention to all the signs. We underestimated uh, everything, I, the whole thing. What happened again? 9-11. Again. Uh, because we're big. Very we're good. Bad, we know everything. We don't have to listen to anybody. We can, nobody's going to do that to us. Well, so because... We don't. And that's the point. That's what this book is about. At dawn, we slept. Okay? Seriously. The record is there for you to see this. That doesn't mean that, look, everybody in this country is bad. Please, I don't want to get into that, you know, bashing, you know, Obama or this guy. But one of the problems that you have really is, kind of got me going here now. Back in the, <laughs> back in the old days, it was an honor to be a congressman. But also, you had a job. When you finished, you went back to a job. Now the only job is to get reelected. Well, now. And so what happens is, is that uh, you haven't served, you haven't been to war, uh, you haven't done this kind of stuff, and so you don't know what you're really, really doing. It, you don't have to be a great baseball player to be a manager. You just have to have played the game. You have to know what it is to sit on the bench. You have to know what it is to call. If the great players don't particularly are not the great managers, but they've done what? They've played the game. So I'm answering you by saying that is one of the problems that you have. It's not an honor. It's getting to be a little better now, but it's still not an honor to serve, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you got to all volunteer. You can go back to the draft, which I'm all for, because then everybody serves, and then you get a feeling for it, et cetera. But that's an, and then you won't go to some war because your son got drafted. Bullshit. But if I, see, if I volunteered to go, then I should do what? If I volunteer to be in the military and I pick up the commissary, the basic change, and I get all the benefits, and I get sent off to war, 
I can't, I, or you sent me away to school to be a doctor, I got to go. Because why? I chose that. My mama says it's bad. She camps out in front of, of uh, a George Bush's house. <laughs> Bull, I'm sorry, baby. He volunteered. Not once, but twice. Now, if he gets drafted, you got another story. That's another whole thing, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned that obviously Roosevelt knew far more than the election of Lee did at this stage. Did he also know the transgression to the Brits and the release of Brown? Uh, I'll repeat it for you. Go ahead. And the release of papers that uh, will be coming out in the next five years. Bearing in mind the relationship of the Axis powers between Germany and Japan, what type of intel was going back and forth between Japan and Germany at that time, which would probably have been picked up through the Enigma um, uh, intel gathering? What happens is, is that we are reading their mail, the German mail, yes. and the German ambassador is talking to the, to the uh, Japanese ambassador, so we're getting some information. <laughs> Uh, but the Japanese, it's a racial thing. How can, if I'm Hitler, how can I like Japanese if I can't stand Russians and Jews? Figure that one out. I mean, <laughs> you got this little, I'm kind of talking bad here now, I know. Uh, you got to watch it. I mean, this is in the context. How can I like, how can I like the Japanese, what a stupid alliance, if I can't stand a Jew or, or a, Can or a uh, uh, Hungarian or Romanian or Bulgarian, etc. I mean, if we're looking at this thing from uh, race and, and culture, to answer you there. So you got the, his question really is how much was going back and forth, not as much as we think, but some. And you could figure out that they were up to something. The bottom line is this, guys. They're coming. The question is, where? And that's where we really got short. You see, one of the things, Torah, 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 how many watched it the other day? Okay, if you watch Torah, 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 one of the big things is the message. If I got a message which said to me, this is a war warning message, the Japanese are on their way, we think they're going to attack the Philippines, I would have sailed. I wouldn't have got caught at Pearl Harbor. Thank God they didn't, because of, uh, they did, because Pearl Harbor was only 35 feet deep. If we'd have gone out to the ocean there, they'd have killed us. See, that's the other thing. They had better pilots, they had better training, etc. In the beginning, they are better. In the end, they can't hack it. In the beginning, they had 10 aircraft carriers. At the end, they had 10. In the beginning, we had four aircraft carriers. At the end, counting all the baby ones, we had 70 or 80. I can't even count them. We were building one a day in Tampa Bay, right? I mean, this is a great arsenal of democracy, a, a great arsenal of, of building. They never had a chance. That's, that's the point I'm really making. The biggest mistake they ever made was hitting us at Pearl Harbor. They might have gotten away with the other thing that they had in us. Now, the question really is, and let me go back to one other, and I'll get you back, I'm sorry. Germany declares war on us. The question is, would we have declared war on Germany? After all, Russia was our ally. And they didn't declare war until the end. Japan was Germany's ally, and they didn't declare war ever on Russia. My argument is that we probably would have beaten the Japanese first, and incidentally, we could have beaten the Japanese in a year. And then dawn where? Europe. Into Europe. Now, one reason we go to Europe first, and this is another racial thing, but it's important. If I could sell every Chinaman one toothpick, God, I'd be a rich guy. The action is where today? Asia. The action is in Indonesia. It's in India. It's in China. Look, Europe's got 300 some billion people. No wonder they can sell cigarettes to the, to the, to the uh, Chinese. We ain't got it. That's all we got. You don't have to sell us cigarettes, right? You got them over there. And what I'm arguing, if you're looking at economic, but because most of us in this room, not all, I'm looking around saying, family came over on a boat somewhere. We came through New York, we came from Europe. So we've always been European oriented, but maybe it's time to be looking other places. This teaches you that too, because you've got to be aware of what that. Somebody else, please. We've got about five minutes. Yes, sir. Knowing Roosevelt and what you say, what would it have taken for him to make the decision not to uh, work with you? Do you think it's. Uh, what would have. The, the, the theory is it was a back door way of getting into the war. England's getting the hell kicked out of them. France is falling. Europe, where we all came from, is in trouble. 
Uh, only Britain stands, the never sub countries, them so, so few, blah, blah, blah. Fight them on the beach and on the land. There's Churchill with his stogie there. It, it, it looks like it's bad. There's bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover and all that crap. So we, 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 got, we, got, we got problems going on there, seriously. And so he wanted to get into that war. He's in that war. He's sending ships over there, for God's sakes. He, he's at Lend Lease. He's, he's, he's giving them money, he's, he's on, but he, that's the war he wanted. He did not want a war in Asia. But conspiracy, Americans love conspiracies. Elvis is still alive. <laughs> Adolf Hitler's down in, was down in Argentina, some damn place doing it. I'm, I did a book on Amelia Earhart. Now they're going out looking for us still. Jesus, now you're going to spend all this money out there. <laughs> I don't understand this country. We got all the people starving and we're going to go out and look for a million yards. <laughs> 75 years, I know, but really, it's kind of stupid. I mean, if they do find it, then there can't be anything left. <laughs> my God. But my point is that it was a conspiracy. She was Tokyo Rose. Uh, she, she, uh, she was spying on the Japanese islands. She had the ship. And, and you, you go into these things. What we found here in the studies is this. Now, you know, I usually close with something, so let me let me let me do this in my and I usually bring my guitar to do it, but let me give you this and then we'll we'll go home. We'll go something like this. Let's remember Pearl Harbor as we go to meet the foe. Let's remember Pearl Harbor as we did the Alamo. We will always remember how to die for liberty. Let's remember Pearl Harbor and go on to victory. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really didn't do what I wanted to do. Thanks, for, no, no. Thanks very much. Um, I have two uh, quick announcements. Uh, Don will stick around for an informal discussion. Um, the the uh, first announcement is that uh, we do have a special person here today, a lot of special people here today. Uh, Delmas, will you please stand up for a second? This is Delmas Wood from uh, Sandy Spring, Maryland. He's an impersonator of Franklin D. Roosevelt, and he has established the FDR Museum in Sandy Spring. Uh, he's going to be a, a World War II uh, commemorative uh, reenactment. Uh, which happens this weekend, June 1st, 2nd, 3rd, in Reading, Pennsylvania. And if you go to www.maam.org, you'll see, uh, it, it, you'll get all the details. So, I say one thing. yes, please, please tell me. Just let me say one thing. I've studied uh, Roosevelt for over 25 years. I have a museum in Maryland, the FDR Living Museum, and a World War II museum. I've heard a lot of speakers on Roosevelt, and this is the only gentleman that I've ever heard that I agree 100% with. I've never seen a speaker be able to give the balance of even talking about the missionaries that flew off and uh, did their, what they do their little graders. And uh, I've talked to people that were familiar with those, and what he's saying is very, very accurate. And the um, only thing I leave you with is Roosevelt made a statement that he will accept nothing less than the unconditional surrender of the Axis battle. That was one of the big uh, uh, factors of World War II. And, uh, you know, Wilson accepted the condition. But this gentleman, I just, my, my hat's off to him for such an accurate presentation. Okay, and I think uh, Jeff Layton, president of the Crows, wants to uh, say some things to Donald. Yes, I would like in closing. Well, let, let's thank Don again, and he, he will stick around. <laughs> thank you. And, um, if I can have your attention, we do have lunches outside here, so there's a box lunch. So if you want to hang around, get your book signed, eat, and talk to Don, please feel free to do so. Thanks.